see how many of you guys uh, are kind of old school church. God is good. All the time. You guys were better than first service. First service didn't know what I was doing. God is good. All the time. Uh, it, is, it is easy, I think, uh, to find myself making that declaration um, on a day like today. And, and I find myself making that declaration because of the journey, because of the times of questioning, because of the uncertainty of what was going to happen, all the different struggles we had to go to to arrive at this moment, at this time, to stand up here and say, God is good, is easy. God is good. This is a, a reoccurring experience, I think, throughout our lives. Arriving at moments in time where we can say, God is good. A lot of people throughout this week have come into this place and asked me, did you, did you see in your mind's eye what this would be? When you and Kevin, almost 20 years ago, were imagining what church might be, what Mercy Hill Church might be, did you see this? Did you guys see like five years ago or 10 years ago that, that God would bring to us to this place to have this as an instrument, as a home for us? And usually my response to that is, um, uh, I, I don't really have much of a vision for next week, let alone five years from now. I, I've, kind of been, I've kind of been in a mode of, I see what God wants us to do today and we try and do it. And then see what he wants us to do tomorrow and try and do it. And it's amazing when you live like that because then you arrive at places that only God has orchestrated. You see God doing incredible things. And so then you come to these moments and you say, God is good. And so this moment is not unlike many moments I've had throughout my, my walk with Christ. Coming to the triumphant moments, coming to exciting moments, coming to these, these monumental moments, being able to say, God is good. I've had those moments before, right? One, one, moment, I, one moment I reflect on almost immediately whenever I think about that is the moment I've explained to you guys before in the past of at age 18, having, having, been, having been called to ministry since the time I was 15 years of age and arriving at that moment in which I was discouraged and I was frustrated and I was ready to walk away from church, ready to walk away from ministry because of all I had seen in church and all I had seen in ministry. And I came to church one night with the intention of, of, of making that my last time. In fact, before I walked through the doors, I said to God, I said, unless you touch me tonight, I will never darken the door of a church again. At the end of the service, as I went forward for, for the altar, up to the altar to pray, this, this beautiful saint, saint of the Lord who, who was my Sunday school teacher came up to me and put her hand on my shoulder and she prophesied over me and said, the Lord would have you know today that he has anointed you to preach the gospel that he has called you to preach the gospel and he will be with you and you will preach and give, give my message to thousands of people. That's one of those moments in which you say what? God is good. When you're in that moment in which, in which you think it's over, in which, you, in, which you're, in, which you're, in which you're in despair and God arrives in that moment and speaks to you, you say God is good. It's one of those moments in my ministry that I point to and I say God is good. I'm reminded of about 15 years later, after investing my life in building a church, spending 10 years of my life sacrificing and giving of myself, and after seeing a church kind of blossom and kind of grow, to see me ripped out of that place, accused of things that I was not guilty of, shunned by those who were my family and were my friends, a church home that I thought was mine to be taken from me. People not willing to talk to me. Coming home during the day and finding my wife in such depression that she was in the fetal position in tears because of what the church had done. And in that moment I say, God is good. You have moments as you get older and you live your life and, and I remember one of the moments I shared with you guys last week that was 
is monumental, one that most of you can identify with who are, who are parents. When my firstborn son was born, I walked in, in, into the room and, and the doctor handed me my first son with his shock black hair and his, and his dimples on both cheeks. And he looks up and smiles at me. He said, God is good. And I reflect on that time in which I walked into a hospital room at hospice where my mom was having her life choked away by fourth stage metastasized cancer. The last time I ever spoke with her. And as I walked in the room, she took my hand and she pulled it up to her lips and she kissed my hand. And with the last amount of strength she had, she looked at me and she said, I love you. In that moment, we say, God is good. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. See, we come to these moments in time, the triumphal moments, the joyous moments, the pleasurable moments, and we declare, God is good. But I fear that it masks the depths of the truth of that declaration. Because the declaration of God's goodness is not dependent on the triumph. The declaration of God's goodness is a reflection of his nature irrespective of my experience. God is good. God is good. It is, it is a part of the stuff of which he is. He is love. He is patience. He is holy. He is mercy. He is justice. He is good. Our circumstances do not change his being. He is good. And this aspect of his nature, this, this part of his nature, of his very being, it is not a fleeting idea. It's not a fleeting revelation in his word. It is, it is part and parcel of what the word of God is telling us about God. Think of Christ's words. When the rich young ruler comes to Jesus... And calls him good teacher. It was a, it was a very common moment. It was a very, it was a very simple moment in which, in which this man comes to Jesus and, and says, good teacher. A simple salutation. But how does Jesus respond? He says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. From the mouth of Jesus, he declares the goodness of God, the, the good nature of God. And he's only declaring what God's word has established from the beginning. He's only declaring in that what was revealed to him in his word from the very beginning, the goodness of God. First Chronicles 16 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his steadfast love endures forever. Ezra 3 says, And they, they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever toward Israel. The psalmist repeats this theme over and over and over again. He says, God, the good and upright, is the Lord. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good and his mercies are everlasting. Jesus declares a truth in his conversation with the rich young ruler, a truth that is expressed time and time and time again in the word of God. And it is an expression about the nature of God. But I really believe there may be no place more instructive for us as we contemplate the goodness of God, irrespective of circumstances, than in Lamentations chapter 3. Jeremiah wrote this, this little book um, as, as um, 
Jerusalem was being destroyed in 587 B.C. And I want you to understand that there was this, there, the enemies were sieging the city of Jerusalem, the, 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 the city of God. They had surrounded it, and they were, they were starving out the people. And, and the pictures of, of the destruction are, are terrible. The loss of, of life, the, the starvation through siege. But there, there is this, this amazing declaration in the middle of this five-chapter book, right in the center, right in, right in chapter 3, that comes with, 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 with the sweetest, most precious words God has ever put in the mouth of the prophet to tell his people. Uh, uh, a, a words from God that, that I think many of us ha- have quoted and many of us have clung to throughout our lives. Those are the words I want to read to you because... They have a stunning effect when you realize in what circumstances they are being declared. Verses 21 through 26 of chapter 3 of Lamentations go like this. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, my soul says. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. I read that. I I, I read that in the context of of the history that is taking place. I read that reflecting on what is happening in Jerusalem, and it boggles my mind. And it really should, should boggle your mind because those precious, those precious words, especially the words, the mercies are new every morning, are spoken in a situation that is horrific in its suffering. The afflictions, the devastation. It is recorded that parents were eating their children because they were being starved to death. The siege was so horrible The end was very near. And the prophet says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good. How do these words get into that book? How do, how do these words fit in this book? In the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the struggle, in, in the recording of, of, of death and destruction, his mercies are new every morning. The Lord is good. How do these words fit in these circumstances? How do these words fit into our lives? How do these words fit in in light of the loss of a friend or the death of a loved one? How do they fit in light of the loss of health, the loss of your wealth, or the pain or the struggle of abuse? His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. How do the words, the steadfast love of the Lord, never ceases, fit into these situations? How can it be that his mercies never come to an end? How, how How does that coexist in the darkness, in the pain, in the struggle? And the heartache. It's a partial explanation. I want to read you two more verses out of the third chapter of Lamentations. Drop your eyes down to verses 32 through 33. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he, God, cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love For he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. 
Here's a brief, a small glimpse into how this fits into the entire story. John Piper explains this passage like this. He says, Now the very least we can draw out of these verses is this. The mercies of God are often hidden and hard to see while they are happening. Because it says, He does cause grief and He does afflict. And yet it says, There is a merciful purpose in it all. And it is not coming from the bottom of our heart. He's not willingly afflict the Son of of Man. There are purposes for his affliction. It is not the thing he delights most to do, and yet he does it. And if we will trust him, there are mercies hidden in there for us. You see, this is a partial truth. The partial truth is this. God directs at times in our lives affliction so that his mercies may be revealed. So that a a depth of truth may be imparted to our lives that ease and comfort can never teach us. I really think this is akin to Paul's testimony of God's response to his torment. If you look at what he writes in 2 Corinthians, he describes his circumstance. I think a lot of times we, we, read, um, we read when Paul talks about the thorn in his flesh, and we consider it kind of a, you know, minor irritant. But you know Paul describes it as torment? And he says, these were the words of God to him as he said, I have this torment, I have this situation, take it from me. And he says, God said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. And so Paul hears that through the midst of his torment, through the midst of his struggle. He hears those words from God. And you know what his response is? Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest in me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He says, when I have, and and remember what what he says here, he's talking about persecution, he's talking about insults, he's talking about things that aren't fair, aren't good, aren't easy. And he says, I delight in that. Because it is only through those circumstances I can see the power of God move. I can see the power of God move in, in a way that he can't, I cannot see, I cannot experience, I cannot feel when things are good. You see, we learn deeply of who God is and can be in these times. And so he may, at times, cause grief. And this is a partial explanation. Because I believe there is a greater truth that that frames this conversation even more appropriately. How is the goodness of God manifest if the circumstances of my life are chaos? How is the goodness of God manifested? How is the goodness of God evident if the circumstances of my life are dark and painful and hurtful? This, I think, is a fulcrum question. I think this is a link pin question. I think this is a foundational question that, that, that defines our faith. The way we answer this will define the way in which we understand who God is. And I think, ultimately, it is a question that kind of misses the deep truth of the gospel. Even being led to this place, even being led to this question, what it indicates is there's something deep about the gospel we don't understand in asking this. This life is chaos. He is peace. This world is dark. He is light. This world is a raging storm. He is our refuge. This life is cruel, and God is good. The message of God's word, the meaning of Christ's gospel work, is that our great hope, 
our great joy, our great peace, our great salvation is not in the circumstances of this life. There is no salvation there. And so God's mercy is revealed in the darkness of life through the gift of Jesus Christ. Do you understand what the coming of Jesus Christ testifies to? It testifies to the truth of the darkness of sin in this world. It testifies to the truth of the brokenness in our hearts and our lives that cannot fulfill us, that cannot satisfy us, that cannot make us joyous. And because of that, Jesus came. Because of that, Jesus came. Jesus, the full manifestation of the goodness of God, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him might have life. You know why? Because without Jesus, there was no life. See, the truth of the gospel is the circumstances of our lives is not what holds for us hope or life. Jesus frames this whole thing beautifully. In John chapter 16, he's leading us in this declaration to a transcendent truth of life beyond world circumstances when he says, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In the world, you have trouble and suffering, but take courage. I have conquered the world. Do you see what he says? He doesn't come in and say, listen, guys, I want you to know in this world, everything will be wonderful. I want you to know that in this world, if you turn to me, everything will be great. Everything is going to be sunshines and cotton candy and pony rides. He doesn't say that, does he? He says, listen, guys, in this life, in this life, you'll have trouble. In this life, you will have suffering. But he says, take heart because in me there's peace. In me there's hope. In me there's life. I've overcome this world. You see, Jesus' declaration here is that there is a transcendency in Jesus Christ that moves beyond the circumstances of our lives. The circumstances define neither God's goodness nor our existence. The circumstances don't define whether or not our life is good. The circumstances don't define whether or not we're at peace. The, 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 the circumstances do not define our lives because of Jesus Christ. Good things are not what testify to God's goodness. His grace in all things testifies to his goodness. Good experiences aren't what prove his goodness. His salvation in the midst of all experiences proves his goodness. It's about him. It's about him as refuge. It's about him as hope. It is about him as our lives. Go back to verse 24 of Lamentations 3 and see what he says there. He writes and he says, The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Do you know what he means by that? What he means by that is when my soul declares my, 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 my gift, my, my, my part of this, my, what satisfies me, what completes me, what makes me whole is the Lord. He's saying when I'm in him, when I know him, when, I, when my soul declares it's not about my circumstances, but it's about him in my life, that's my portion. That's what I get. That's what I receive. In, the, in, a, in a tumultuous world, he is the good. In the circumstances of a broken world, he is the refuge of good. In the chaos of the sin-marred world, he is the harbor of good. The encouragement all throughout Scripture is not that because he is good, all in your life will be easy, but that because the world is full of chaos, his goodness provides us hope. 
The message is that the heart of God's goodness is that he transcends the chaos, that he shines through the darkness, that he is the refuge in the storm. It's why the psalmist wrote and said, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Why do we need a refuge? But that there is terror in the darkness. He is our refuge and our strength. He is a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters may roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The declaration that he is our refuge, that he is our strength, that he is the present help in trouble is a companion to the chaos of the mountains being moved, the, the, the sea being foamed, that everything being around us, that which would cause fear, but we fear not, for he is our refuge, he is our strength. I can, I can tell you that I see evidence of the goodness of God in this day. I, I, I see evidence of the goodness of God in this place. How he's moved, how he's provided, how his, how his hand has been on it each step of the way. I can see the evidence of God's goodness here. And so when we stand and say God is good in the midst and the shadow of these circumstances, it's okay. It's true, it's right. But the evidence of the goodness of God we seek, the evidence of the goodness of God we desire, that we gather to experience, is the goodness of God manifested in the lives of people that have discovered his transcendent mercy. That have found freedom from seeking hope in the darkness of this world, that have discovered a joy that sets them free from pain, that has crushed their spirit. God is that good. The goodness of God manifested in a building, in circumstances, in wealth, is to me a very shallow God. But the goodness of God manifested in the lives of people who have learned to put their hope in him, who have found refuge in him, who have peace that passes all understanding. That is a goodness that can never be matched by anything in this life. If you're here this morning, there is only one who is good, and it is God. My encouragement to you is find refuge in him. For me, whether it was in the prophetic moment, moment or the loneliness, whether in the gift of my firstborn son or in the loss of my mom, I found refuge in him. I found peace in him. I found hope in him. I found salvation in him. Because God is good. If you're here this morning enslaved to your sin, I invite you to find freedom by turning from your sin and repentance to the face of your loving Savior. If you're here in the darkness of depression and anxiety, I invite you to find the light of Christ in the promise of his provision flowing from his love for you. If you are here undone by the storm of circumstances, I invite you to find refuge in the peace of God that passes all understanding. And if you're here today thankful for all he has done for you, 
moved by the manifestation of his mercies in your life, I invite you to rejoice in the goodness of God. Because God is good. Heavenly Father,